So really quickly, before we jump into the information session, again, I'm just waiting for the last few of you to share your first and last name in the chat. And while you do that, I'll go ahead and introduce our two presenters. We have Amy Kennedy, who is an advisor for our International Relations Program. She works with students very closely and knows a lot about how the program is designed. So she'll be helping you uh, kind of understand the ins and outs of the program. Same goes for Professor McDowell, who is joining us from the Political Science Program. So you'll be hearing from each of them tonight. I, again, am a representative from admissions. I am happy to answer your questions about financial aid, the university in general, scholarships, the Common App. Tonight is not the best time. We need to be focusing our attention on what our staff from the Maxwell School have to offer you. I do the other questions every single day of the week, almost all day via email and in Zoom calls. So if you have questions for me, go ahead and send me a private message in the chat and I can answer you or send me an email, request another meeting with me. But tonight's session is really gonna focus on the international relations and political science major. So just be a little bit mindful of that. Uh, we do have presenters in the room that it is not their job to be here. They are doing a big favor to you to be here and talk to you about the program. So let's focus our questions on them and, and what they're here to talk with you about. So this one, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Amy, who is gonna tell you a little bit more about international relations. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, really glad to see everyone here tonight and to have an opportunity to chat with you about the international relations program. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Amy Kennedy. I'm the academic advisor for the program. Um, I've been in that role for about eight years. I do have a master's degree in international relations and um, spent some time working in international development prior to joining SU in this role. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so the international relations program, um, we are a multidisciplinary program that's housed both within the College of Arts and Sciences of Max and Maxwell. Um, we have very focused and individualized academic advising through the program because you are able to tailor uh, your studies to your interests. And I'll get a little bit more into how that works within the curriculum. Um, but that structure of the program where you can really focus on something different than perhaps the folks sitting next to you in class uh, really does require some individualized focused um, staff advising. Our office, oh, can we go back for a minute? Um, our office has um, a really great welcoming environment. We have a really great team in the office. There are a lot of student clubs and activities. Um, and, and we have people just, maybe not during coronavirus times, but, but normal semesters just coming to hang out in our office on a regular basis. We have about 300 students, 20% are international. Um, two thirds of our students study off campus at least once during their time at Syracuse. Um, and over half have a second major um, somewhere in the university, many of um, many of those are arts and sciences. Many of them are Maxwell, um, and our office also offers minors in global political economy and global security studies. You can go ahead. Next slide. Um, so the structure of the program is uh, pretty straightforward. We have three introductory courses that all of our students take. Um, because we're multidisciplinary, these span a couple of departments. There's a required political science course that is an introduction to international relations, a required introduction to microeconomics, um, and then either an anthropology course or an interdisciplinary course on global community. Students have to receive a B or better in one of those courses before they officially declare the major, but you're welcome to come and chat with our office at any point during that time. We do have a language proficiency requirement and it is one semester beyond what arts and science requires. Um, so for the College of Arts and Sciences, students need to take three semesters of the language. For international relations, it is through the fourth semester. And we usually get a lot of questions about different configurations of that. And I'm happy to chat with anyone about that either um, in this session or um, through Rachel, you can reach out to me directly. Um, and I, I can chat about what your situation would be. I mentioned that the program's pretty tailored to your specific interests. So all of our students choose a region of the world to focus their studies on. Those regions are Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, Middle East, North Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean. And students take three courses on their region. And those come from courses throughout the social science department. So students are taking courses in anthropology, geography, economics, history, political science, and sociology. Um, students also choose a topic concentration. This is like a subfield in international affairs. So students can focus on intercultural communications, 
international political economy, international law and organization, or international security and diplomacy. And just like with the region, they take courses from the various social science departments. Students are also required to take a research methods course um, that gives them some foundational information in how to uh, develop and carry out a research project. And we finish the major with a senior capstone project where students do an original research project focused on their topic and region for the major. Next slide. As I mentioned, about two thirds of our students uh, spend at least one semester off campus. That's a really big part of the international relations major. We think it's really important for students to get out there, study abroad. Um, and we have students go all over the world. So Rachel, if you could hit the first one, that is our program in uh, Washington, DC. Very policy focused. Students can go there for a semester, do an internship and learn all about how Washington works and uh, the different opportunities um, that exist there. Next button. Those markers are where our SU centers are, where students are able to study sort of at an SU property, taking SU classes through an SU institution. Um, they're located in London, Madrid, Strasbourg, Florence, Wrocław, Poland, Hong Kong, and Santiago. Um, those offer, most of them offer uh, semester and summer, some are just semester programs, um, but there's a lot of different opportunities there. Next button. We also have world partner programs and those kind of fill out the rest of the world. This is more of where students are doing an exchange program with a different university or studying abroad through a third party provider. They still receive SU credit for the courses that are taken and many of those courses do apply to their IR majors. Um, these are just the locations that we've had IR students go to. There are many other locations throughout the world where SU offers study abroad programs. Um, but we work very closely with students so that no matter where they do study abroad or off campus, they're able to integrate that into their study and into their major requirements. Next slide. We have a ton of opportunities for students um, to get involved with the program outside of the classroom. Uh, there's an international relations learning community for first year students. So they live and learn together um, in one of our residence halls and they take our, one of our introductory courses together. Each semester, we have a lot of lectures and presentations from guest speakers. Some of them are more academically geared. Some of them are more professionally geared. Um, and because we're housed in the Maxwell School, we have access to all of the different speakers um, that are coming through the various research centers here, such as the Moynihan Center. We have a very uh, well-established Model United Nations program um, that students can participate in um, for credit in the spring and the fall, they spend a semester um, learning about a specific country and then go to conferences in either Washington DC or New York to represent that country. Um, our team just finished uh, the conference virtually this year in uh, Washington DC and um, we'll be doing the virtual conference for New York in the spring. So that's a, it's a really great program and we have students who participate that, in that for multiple years. Um, and they've, they've won awards and are very well recognized within, within that program. Um, we have an honor society for um, high achieving students in the major. And some of those students are also invited to participate in undergraduate research with various faculty and research centers on campus, um, participate in student conferences around the country and participate in our distinction program where students do a more rigorous capstone research project um, under the direction of one of the faculty for the program. We also, in collaboration with a couple of other departments on campus, host professional development workshops geared towards helping students understand how to prepare for their careers or graduate school after graduation. Um, this ranges from things like resume workshops, cover letter workshops, how to search for internships, um, understanding how to apply to graduate school, looking at financial aid for graduate school, all kinds of different things. Um, and so we draw on resources from the local community, from our alumni, um, and from across campus to host those for any Maxwell undergraduate students. I mentioned we have the Maxwell in Washington program, runs every fall and spring for juniors and seniors, which is a really great opportunity to kind of get some on the ground experience. And then there's a number of student clubs and organizations on campus focused on international affairs. Some of those are specifically affiliated with our office, many of them are not. Um, and the students that major in international relations are, are very active in the student organization life on campus. Next slide. 
Um, common question I get is where do our students end up? And the answer is really, it depends on what you're interested in and what you want to do. International affairs is a pretty broad field. And so it's incumbent upon students to really do their research and figure out what opportunities are exciting to them. We have a lot of resources to help you navigate that process over your four years on campus. Um, we have students who end up in government, nonprofits, public sector, private sector, international organizations, working on everything from economic development, human rights advocacy, consulting, um, diplomats, um, environmental sustainability issues, you name it, we have an alum doing it in some capacity. Um, many of our students right after graduation enter the workforce, others go directly into graduate school or law school or participate in service organizations like AmeriCorps or Peace Corps for a couple of years before making that next. Our alumni are all over the world and all over the world they are active and engaged with us. Um, we run mentorship programs with alumni. We connect students with alums. We bring alums back to talk about their experiences in the workforce or their experiences as a student on a regular basis. Um, and so that's a really great opportunity to learn from people who have been in the, in the program recently and see how they've used it and learn about what opportunities are out there professionally. Next slide. So that's um, going to be a broad strokes overview. There is a lot of information about the curriculum in terms of specific courses, specific clubs, um, and other resources on our website. I am happy to talk to anyone um, during this, or uh, you can contact us. There's an um, email address on the screen and also a contact us link on our website. I will most likely be the person answering that email. You are welcome to email me at any point. So thanks. Fantastic. So we did have quite a few good questions come in um, and I'm happy to run through these um, and Amy, let me let you know what questions we have. And then if I have something related to me, I'll answer it one sentence and we'll keep going. Um, okay. So the first question I see is a private message. So students in the room, if you're confused where this is coming from, it was a private message to me. Um, asking about foreign languages available for the international, rela international relations major. This student is particularly interested in French and Japanese, but could you just speak really quickly to what students have done in the past and the, the wealth of language offerings we have? Yeah, sure. So there are a lot of languages offered at SU and I, I would name them all, but I'm afraid I would forget one or two. So I don't really want to go into the specifics. French and Japanese are certainly on offer. Um, we do encourage students to select a, a language to study that matches the region they're focused on for the major. So if you're focused on the region of Asia, You've got options of Korean, Japanese, Chinese, um, Hindi, if you're interested in South Asia, Europe, there's a ton of options there. Um, for international students, I know it's a little different and many of you would be taking the English as a second language courses. And that's something we work with our students on to figure out how to balance those things out. We also have students who take more than one language. Certainly, language is a very big topic at Syracuse. We offer 14 different languages. so. Like Amy said, I will not be bold enough to try to list all those 14, but they're certainly available on our website in the languages department site. Uh, another question, uh, how easy is it to switch majors if accepted into a certain program at later would wish to change? And I know this student cannot be the only one wondering this, so this is a big question. It's super, super easy. Um, different programs have different requirements to actually administratively make that happen. For instance, the international relations department requires you to meet with one of our advisors before you declare the major, just so we can review all the requirements and learn about what your goals are and make sure that we're working for that. But, but the actual paperwork to switch majors is very, very easy. Agreed. Uh, another kind of paperwork related question, which I'll answer, if I'm a transfer student, how do I know which of my credits will transfer? This is a good question, and I'll give you a couple of pointers. One, you need to get at least a C in the course that you're bringing the course, or the in the course where you're bringing the credit from, you have to originally get a C for it to transfer to Syracuse. We also need to offer a similar course at Syracuse, which you can evaluate on your own to some level of proficiency using our course catalog, which is publicly available. And then once you apply, if you're admitted, we will give you a full transfer credit evaluation. So one of our advisors will go through and tell you exactly which courses will come in and how they will transfer, i.e. which credits they will take the place of at Syracuse. And you'll have that info before you have to make your decision whether to attend Syracuse or not. Um, is there 
any program for international relations that, it, or I, I think the student means, is there a concentration within international relations that is not regionally limited? And the student asks because they wonder what if one wants to study a certain topic across multiple regions? Sure. So for instance, let's pretend that you're interested in human rights. Um, so students have, that would fall in our um, international law and organization concentration. So you would be taking at least three courses um, on international law and organizations focused on human rights. Um, you would still have to choose a regional concentration and take three courses on that, but the coursework that you would take on human rights could focus on any region of the world. The only place um, that they have to come together is for the capstone research project. Um, but it is absolutely possible in fact, I would say many students identify more with either their region or their topic concentration. Um, and so you may be a person who is a topic concentration person and you're selecting a region because you need to, essentially. Um, but, but your goal is to work on that topic concentration and focus on that primarily. So I'm going to choose one more question before we go on to Professor McDowell's slides. This is not the only question. Amy, if you would like to veg out in the chat and respond to some students' questions while Professor McDowell is talking, I'm sure that would be fine. Um, or students, this is a good time to take down the IR advisor at maxwell.syr.edu email address and send your questions there or send them to my email address, which I'll also put back up at the end of the presentation. So let's see, who is the lucky winter winner? Um, Let's go with which kinds of research opportunities are available to specific, specifically to international relations students, or I guess better that are of interest to international relations students. So students, internships mm -hmm. at Syracuse by a huge majority are not limited to a specific major. Our students apply to internships that are interesting to them and your major doesn't restrict you. But I think Amy could give you some examples of things that might be interesting. Okay, so are we doing internships or research opportunities? Sorry, research opportunities. Research opportunities, okay. Same um, so everyone in the, in the international relations major does an original research project. That's a requirement for our capstone. Um, so everyone is doing at least one original research project by the time they graduate. In addition to that, um, we have an undergraduate research program within the major where students are paired with a faculty member in our office or with one of the research centers in Maxwell to support the research that's being done. Um, so we've had students working with a number of different faculty and different research centers on a wide variety of issues. Um, also, we have quite a few students who are in the honors program or who are in our distinction program and they do additional research through those programs. Um, sometimes honors projects are related to international relations, sometimes they are not. Um, and then Rachel, I don't know if you provide information about the source um, and sort of the research funding and opportunities that are available through that program as well. Yes, so that's something that I talk about in every single one of my general info sessions about the college, which is students, Syracuse commits a million dollars every year to undergraduate research, which is unique about Syracuse because most universities support their faculty and their graduate students because research is often a big part of their job. Syracuse supports undergraduates. The source provides a lot of support financially and socially, I would say, in, in terms of advising for students. So if your question is anything from, I know research is important, Amy said so, now I'm at Syracuse and I have no idea what I wanna do, they can help you, right? Or maybe you're getting more specific. I know I'm interested in uh, immigration policy from a specific country. I don't really know who works on that. Wh who might be some good faculty for you or if they, maybe they can answer that. Or now you've been doing research at Syracuse for two, three years and you have a research project and you have a hypothesis and you have some data you'd like to share. Uh, they can help you find opportunities to present that or opportunities to get scholarships that might send you abroad to work on that topic or send you to a conference where you can present that. So the source provides all kinds of support in a lot of different ways to our students. And again, this is not unique to international relations or to political science or to anyone we're talking about tonight. It's just a resource that we provide to any student, regardless of their interest. 
Rachel, I would say the one other piece that, that might be a bit more IR specific about that, not related to the source though, is that um, a lot of our students have the opportunity to do independent research or independent study projects while they're studying abroad, um, which is a really interesting um, opportunity for them. And in Washington, D.C., uh, while the, the academic structure is a bit different, um, many students are doing interviews with policymakers and organizations and turning those into action memos, which, which is an entirely different way of approaching um, the field that you're interested in. Absolutely. So this point we're going to move on. I know there are questions in the chat. I'm not interested in ignoring those questions, but we can't sit here and ignore the fact that we have an entire another presenter and a whole group of students that want to hear about our next topic, which is political science. So Amy, again, if you'd like to answer some questions in the chat, feel welcome to do that. Right now we'll switch gears to Professor McDowell and I will assume that any new questions from this point are for Professor McDowell. And again, I will cherry pick a few so that he can answer those at the end of the presentation. If we have time at the end to circle back to some of the questions we had earlier, I would be happy to do that. So Professor McDowell, take it away. Just let me know when you'd like me to switch your slides. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. And good afternoon, good evening. Good morning, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, I'm glad you're here. It's nice to have a chance to talk to you for a little bit about the political science major at Syracuse University. Uh, my name is Daniel McDowell. I'm a professor in the department. Uh, this is my ninth year at SU. Uh, this is my first year in the director of undergraduate studies role. Uh, and uh, I've been enjoying that uh, experience. I get to think more about the kinds of things we're talking about right now than I've had to in the past. And so uh, I'm looking forward to talking about the major as a, as a whole here in a moment. So you can go ahead and uh, move on to the next slide there, Rachel. Uh, I'm also glad that uh, Amy had a chance to talk first. As you'll see, there are some similarities and overlap in the opportunities to our students as there are in international relations. And I did see that someone a moment ago asked the question uh, whether or not there were classes that IR and political science share. Um, and to that, I can say, you know, I'm, I'm a, a professor in the political science department. I happen to specialize in international relations as my area of study. And I teach courses that IR students take, and I teach courses that uh, political science students take. You'll often be in a class with, you know, a, a mixture of, of students from, from different Maxwell departments. And so the answer to that question, just to get out ahead of that one, is yes. Um, so uh, let me talk now just for, for a bit about political science as a major and what that looks like. Uh, and then maybe we can get back into having a conversation about kind of the intersection of these things. So it might be useful first to just talk for a moment about political science as a field of study. Um, it's obviously a social science and now pretty well established social science. Um, and, you know, political science is the study of politics and political processes. Harold Laswell, who is a, a major political scientist in the 20th century, once said that politics is about who gets what, when, and how. Um, and so if you think about it that way, uh, this is the study of who gets what, when, and how. Um, political science is interested in all kinds of questions. We could sort of categorize some of the big ones as trying to understand who has the power and the authority to govern in uh, political systems. Political science is interested in what are the different types of government that exist in the world and when uh, do they succeed and when do they fail. It's interested in the ideas that shape politics and shape government. It's interested in the actual processes and functioning of government. How are policies made? Uh, sometimes uh, folks like to use the term, right? How the sausage is made before it, uh, before it actually comes out on the shelf. So what happens behind the scenes of government? Um, or how do we explain the policy choices that governments make? It might be puzzling when we look at the world and try to, try to understand why in the world did uh, did this government choose to, to go in this direction? So political science is interested in that. It's also interested in people, right? Just everyday people and how they react to all of these different things we've, we've discussed above. So there are lots of, uh, lots of research into political behavior, trying to understand um, the way individuals and voters behave and why they respond in certain ways uh, to different political phenomena. So political science is, is a big field uh, where there are all kinds of questions being asked and research being done in all different kinds of ways. It's a really exciting field and uh, a place that I think there's a lot of growth uh, over the last uh, few years and, and I think a really good place for a, um, an undergraduate student to, to jump into a really exciting uh, area of study. Okay, you can go on to the next slide now, Rachel. 
So uh, the Department of Political Science, uh, we are in the Maxwell School. Uh, we are in Eggers Hall. There's a photo of it right there. So my office is uh, just in the door uh, and uh, swing a right and up the stairs on the third floor. That's where I, I live at. Uh, our professor, or excuse me, our chair of our department is Professor Shana Guderian. She's an expert on American political behavior um, and uh, public opinion. She's working on a book right now on uh, the politics of uh, COVID-19, so pandemic politics. So she studies American politics with an eye towards political behavior. Uh, I'm our undergraduate studies director. As I said, I study international relations. My research is mostly focused on things uh, related to the global economy and the politics of economic relations. Um, we have 30, more than 30 full-time faculty in political science. And um, you know, Professor Guderian and myself obviously study very different things. You can imagine the broad range of, uh, of topics that our faculty look at across uh, areas of international relations, what we call comparative politics, American politics, and political theory. Uh, we also have a really terrific undergraduate academic advisor, and that's Ms. Candy Brooks. Um, and she really handles a lot of the individual level interaction with our students doing the advising work. And she knows, frankly, uh, far more about the inner workings of the program than I do. I don't know what we would do without her. She's just a tremendous asset. Um, and just a, a, an excellent um, uh, person for our students to get to know uh, very early on. And, and she's uh, in, incredibly responsive and helpful. And so I wanted to shout her out as well because we wouldn't be half the program we were without, without her. Uh, okay, you can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So in uh, political science, we have uh, at Syracuse, we have nine concentrations. And so I wanna just talk about this because it kind of gives you a sense of the contours uh, of the different areas you can, you can study within the major. And so within these nine concentrations, we have four what I would call more traditional concentrations, and that would be American politics. And so uh, this would include all of the courses that are just related to American politics and government. Uh, then there's a subfield or concentration called comparative politics, which is really uh, the study of domestic politics, but not limited to the United States. So you might take a class on say, European politics, or you might take a class on Middle East politics or a class on the politics of India. These would all be courses that we would classify as comparative politics. Then there's international relations. That's where, where I've done uh, most of my studies and work. And that's kind of the, the study of the politics uh, uh, in interactions of nation states themselves rather than the internal domestic politics. Um, and then we've got political theory. Um, which, is, uh, which is obviously uh, rooted in, um, in, in a lot of uh, both uh, sort of uh, 18th, 19th century political theory and modern political theory. So lots of sort of historical engagement there with ideas in politics. And then we've got these uh, other five concentrations that I would say cut across these traditional boundaries. And so law and courts, you might take a, a course that's uh, about say, uh, the, the uh, Islamic law, for instance, which would be a comparative politics course. It's not studying American politics, right? Uh, but you might also take a class on law and courts in the United States, constitutional law, for instance. Uh, we also have a political economy uh, concentration, a public policy concentration, uh, a newer concentration called race, class, and gender, exploring issues of identity in American politics, and then finally, security studies as well. Um, and so I'll, in a second here, when I look at the major requirements, I'll come back to these concentrations. You'll sort of see how that fits into the major. Uh, okay, you can go ahead and move on to the next slide, Rachel. Thank you. So for the, uh, a major in political science, I would describe political science as a pretty flexible major. Uh, and I mean flexible in that um, compared, to other compared to many other majors in Maxwell, there are, there are, I would say there's a bit less rigidity in the requirements and there's a, a bit more freedom for students um, to sort of pick and choose. And so there aren't as many requirements to meet, I guess would be one way to look at it. And that may be a, may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what your interests are. Uh, but I just wanna sort of put that out as a sort of a, a place of contrast here. Um, so the lower division requirements for political science are pretty simple. Everyone has to take our American National Government course. That's 121. That should be the first class you enroll in in the fall when you arrive. Uh, and every student has to take our Intro to Political Analysis course, which is essentially our political methodology class. Um, and then 
uh, students are required to take one more class at the 100 or 200 level. So that's a total of three classes at uh, the lower division level. Then students also need to take six courses that are upper division courses. That would be 300 level or above. Uh, and within these six courses or a total of 18 credits, three of those classes need to be within one of those concentrations I mentioned before. So that's the one sort of thing that you're, you're expected to do. You've got to take these total of 30 credits in political science and uh, nine of those credits need to be within one of those concentrations. Generally speaking, it's very easy to get nine credits in one concentration because there's a lot to choose from. Now, some concentrations have more classes than others. Um, and so if you choose one where there aren't as many courses and, and I can share in a moment a link that shows you our classes and where they fit on the concentrations list. Um, uh, some of them, it might be a little bit harder if there aren't as many options, but generally speaking, students don't have trouble meeting the concentration requirement. Um, and so uh, that's, again, one of the, I think, uh, it, it, nice things about political science is the flexibility. And then finally, you have to take one class that is at any level. It can be another 100 level or all the way up to a 400 level course. Uh, and at least one of your classes needs to have an international component. So even if you're someone who studies American politics, we require one class to be at uh, sort of the international level. Okay, um, you can go ahead and move on to the next slide. In fact, what I'll do now real quick is share in the chat room here. This is a link to uh, our course catalog. So if you wanna see the different courses we offer, you can look there and it'll show you by concentration how those courses are listed. In case you're thinking of maybe a minor, we do offer a political science minor. Um, this is only 18 credits or six courses. It's even sort of easier to achieve. You only need one of those 100 level courses. You can pick any one. Uh, and then four uh, classes at the 300, 400 level, and then one additional any level course that has some international content. So a minor is something you can also pick up as well if that's of interest to you. Okay, Rachel, you can move on to the next one. So uh, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, research opportunities. Um, Amy talked, uh, did a great job of, of discussing research opportunities in IR. Um, and so a lot of that similar, I will say that political science students can enroll in the IR um, capstone courses. I had the chance to teach one for the first time last year, which was a really cool experience for me. It was a class on global, global economic governance. So we looked at uh, the, the World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund. We talked about uh, the global aid regime uh, and students obviously had to write their capstone papers. And many of those students were IR students but we also had some political science students as well because a, a number of those IR capstone courses are taught by political science faculty. And so they're, they are uh, also considered political science courses. So that's an option. Um, and then we also have um, what's called the political science distinction program. And I'm gonna talk about that just for a minute because uh, I think it's a really, uh, really awesome program for students that are really interested in doing their own independent research. Uh, it's a small, it's a, a small program. We average between 10 to 15 students that are in that. I think right now there's, there's about 10 students in the distinction program. It is selective. You have to have, I think a 3.7 GPA. You have to be a senior to start uh, in that program. Uh, but the students who really want to do research, one of the advantages of this is it's a year long program. Uh, and so a lot of the honors programs here, here you're, you're really working within the course of a single semester to produce a research project. Uh, which is great and students do tremendous work. Uh, but the nice thing about distinction is you start in the fall and you're with that same group of 10 students through the fall semester and through the spring semester. So you spend a whole year with this group of students and with the instructor of that program who is there to kind of guide that small group through the research project or process. Uh, and that extra time helps because you really, uh, you, you really have a chance to kind of iron out all of the wrinkles in the, in, uh, in the project. You also have an advisor who's a faculty member in political science, uh, and then you have a first reader and a second reader. So you end up working with a team of three faculty members, uh, two of whom must be from political science. One can be from outside the department. Um, and again, over the course of an entire year, you get to build those relationships with those faculty members. I'm advising um, a student in the distinction program now. I had the opportunity to lead the program several years ago, uh, and now I get the chance to still advise some of our students uh, and she's working on a project on uh, racial diversity and education policy, a really interesting uh, project that she's about, you know, midway through right now. And so it's fun to see that come together. You can see in those photos I have in the slides, uh, it's uh, on your, your, the left-hand side of the slide there is a, 
an image of our uh, Maxwell Celebration of Undergraduate Scholarship, which some of those students are IR capstone students presenting their, their research as well. We've got our distinction pro, uh, students down there. It's really a great uh, time of year. It's in early May every, uh, every uh, spring semester and students uh, make uh, research posters that present their, uh, their uh, findings. And uh, then we have faculty and students and parents just kind of milling about and talking to students about their research. Uh, and it's a really fun time. And there's a photo on the right, there's me with a couple of our distinction program students from, from a couple of years ago. Um, and just to give you a, a quick idea of some of the projects that students worked on, um, uh, we've got students who've written projects on uh, the link between uh, elected prosecutors uh, at the local level and whether or not that contributes to mass incarceration. Students have worked on projects on uh, how uh, communication strategies can affect public attitudes on climate change. Students have worked on how partisan realignment developed in the American South over the latter half of the 20th century. And students have worked on uh, projects looking into the causes of civil war in Syria. So that's just four examples. Um, in the end, uh, a, a distinction project is entirely up to the student and their advisor. Uh, and so it's really as, as far as you can sort of take your creativity and your inspiration on a project like that. Um, okay, Rachel, you can go ahead and Go on to the next slide, I guess. Um, and then uh, talk just for a moment about additional opportunities uh, for our students. And this will just echo a lot of what Amy discussed earlier and did a tremendous job talking about here, um, which includes the Maxwell and DC program and the study abroad program. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. I will talk about a couple of things that are a bit specific to political science. And one is our, uh, a couple of our internship opportunities one is this uh, political science PSC, if you didn't, I should have specified this earlier, that's our, our shorthand for political science at Syracuse. So political science 317 uh, is a local internship program that's uh, been uh, offered to our students here for, un, for a long time. Um, it places students into congressional or state legislative offices. Um, you can work in the county or sit with the county or city executive in a political campaign organization or the DA's office. Uh, so it's a really great program uh, where you don't actually have to leave campus. We encourage students to do opportunities off campus, but you can also get internship experience on campus in political science. Uh, there's also the Albany Assembly Internship Program. And so this is a, a place where students can go and get course credit and actually be in a paid internship um, working with New York State legislatures. Uh, so again, you can be off campus, but you don't have to leave New York State. You can, you can stay reasonably close if you want. And that's a program that typically are junior uh, juniors enroll in if you're interested in that uh, and then there are also internship opportunities through uh, Maxwell and uh, DC program uh, where you can get in uh, internships with the federal government or nonprofit organizations or policy think tanks uh, as well and then there are some internship opportunities through study abroad as well um, and then just in terms of you know opportunities to take courses off campus uh, as Amy had said Maxwell and DC, study abroad are both opportunities here. Political science courses are offered at every SU abroad center, uh, a lot of them at uh, the Strasbourg, uh, but there are, uh, there are classes at, at every other center as well. So if you wanna study abroad, regardless of where you wanna go, you can get PSC credit while you're, while you're um, enjoying some new experience in a, in a new part of the world. And I think that's the last slide if I'm remembering correctly, so. Great. And I, I'll tell you what, I'll share in the, since I didn't add a slide with this, I'm going to just in the chat box, share uh, Ms. Candy Brooks email and I'll share my email as well. Um, and if you have any questions about political science um, that we don't get to answer right now, you can email me or you can email uh, Candy and we'd be happy to help. Yes, so students, this is a good time to copy paste from the chat, take a photo of your screen, and you'll get that contact information from us. And both of our faculty or both of our staff today have offered to talk with you via email, which is not what everyone does. So take advantage of that. Know that this is not a super common offer, uh, one that you may not receive at all from some of the other schools you're applying to. So do take advantage of that. Although I'm happy to correspond with you via email if you have questions. So I've been taking notes on what questions you have so that we can knock out your questions. Again, I think there are one or two that I can respond to just in a quick sentence, but the rest for Professor McDowell. Uh, the first one is, and I think we're sensing a theme with tonight's students. These are gonna be good CRQ students because they're interested in dabbling across all different fields and they're already kind of chomping at the bit. 
They want to know, is it possible to complete more than one concentration within the major? You know, it is. Um, and we've actually been having conversations. So in my, my first uh, meeting this fall with our, our undergraduate studies committee, we discussed sort of making that explicit. We've had students that have, have earned multiple concentrations, but we hadn't really made it sort of publicly known because we didn't realize there was demand and interest in it, uh, demand for it and interest in it. Um, and so the, the answer to that is yes, students can earn multiple concentrations if they want, but only one is required for the major. Awesome. Uh, another student wants to know how many students triple major. And to <laughs> that I say, calm down. But we do have students who do certainly triple major at Syracuse. I don't know what the number is. I don't know if either of our presenters would want to venture a guess. It's possible. Uh, I don't like to oversell, however. So we do not expect that our students complete three majors. We do not coach our students to complete three majors. Students who complete three majors tend to bring in a lot of AP, IB, CLEP, or SUPA credit, meaning that they've knocked out a lot of these courses already. So they're just transferring in credit, which frees up a lot of space, which can then contribute to another program. These students often take more classes than many of their friends during the academic year. And for some students, that's great. For other students, that can be very stressful. So it's kind of a matter of feeling it out, I think, once on campus and not setting your mind on that now. See, see what it's like to be in a college curriculum with, you know, everything going on around you, being in a new environment and taking a courses in a very different way before you make that decision. And then students can also take courses during the summer to help with this as well. So it's possible. And again, I don't know if presenters, you want to mention any students that you've known who have done this or, or venture, I guess, as to how common it is out of my student ambassadors, uh, which are about 150 students. I know one student who is triple majoring. So I just like to be transparent about that. I will say that I, I don't know very many. I, I could come up with a small handful that I've known in the eight years I've been advising. Um, but I, I would sort of echo what Rachel said about um, it would be very challenging to do, and it's certainly not expected. And for anyone who um, is considering that path, I would encourage you to think very carefully about what the value added of each of those majors is. Um, so for instance, it's possible to do an international relations major with a Middle East, North Africa focus, a political science major, and taking a lot of courses on international affairs and a Middle East studies major. Um, I don't believe that that is necessary for any job application or graduate school application at all. And in fact, it may end up being a little bit redundant down the road. And, and maybe in that case, it would be better to switch one to a minor in economics or history or business or communications or something like that, that brings in a different set of knowledge and analytical perspectives. That's a conversation I have with students on a regular basis, so I'm just going to throw it out there. Yes, that is excellent advice. Another question for Professor McDowell, can I double major in political science and something outside of Maxwell? And maybe some of you can guess the answer to this, but I'll let Professor McDowell kind of chat about that. And if you know any examples of students, I'm sure they'd love to hear that. Uh, and I don't have an example off of the top of my head, but I know students do this. I mean, I will say that it, it's typically easier. I think the way what, what uh, Amy was just saying is actually really great advice, which it's, it's probably more useful if you're thinking strategically about the job market and careers to have, um, if, if you do want to go in a direction of a double major, which again is not expected. And I think sometimes students, especially today, enter college and have this sense of an arms race and I have to have four majors or I'm not going to be, you know, um, as competitive as other students. And I don't think that that it, it, it necessarily translates that well. And I think that the suggestion of thinking of maybe a, if you wanted to pick up a minor or, or if you did want to do a double major in something that's a bit different to kind of bring in a different set of skills, that that probably makes more sense than trying to sort of pile up all these majors sort of that are already pretty close to one another. Um, that's not to say that it's, it isn't a path that works for some students, but um, that would be my general reaction to it. And, and yes, you can major in, um, in, do a double major outside of Maxwell, but it is, um, it, it, it's different because, you know, when I, when I meet with students who are, let's say, doing um, a, a degree in, um, or excuse me, working on a major over in Newhouse of the Communication School, and then they're in uh, Maxwell as well, there's a whole different set of requirements for that. And when they're talking to me about courses to take, 
my answer is usually, I don't know what the requirements are for that program. I can tell you all about ours, but I, you know, you need to go talk to that advisor. And so it is a bit, you know, it's, it's again, not to discourage it, but you would have to be um, dealing with sort of different sets of expectations and requirements. Um, and, and so if you're, you'd, you'd want to make sure that you're sort of on that from day one, making sure you're getting all of your ducks in a row so you don't end up you know, having to stick around an extra semester or something to, to meet that requirement. So it's possible. It just makes things a little more complicated. I don't know, Rachel, you may have more to add to that. No, I think that's great advice. Um, most of the topics that we'll say tonight with in terms of study abroad, double majoring, triple majoring, changing your major halfway through the year, deciding I'm a senior and I didn't like this all along and I want to switch. The best thing you can do is be in constant contact with your advisor. And at Syracuse, you'll have multiple You'll have someone like Amy within your major. You'll have a career advisor. You'll have an advisor um, within arts and sciences for general academic purposes. You'll have an advisor through your research. You'll have an advisor through study abroad. We are going to over advise. So take advantage of that, right? Make sure that you just are planning ahead and thinking about what is actually going to benefit your resume and your career. Um, and don't, don't overdo it, right? The student with three majors is likely not performing very well at their internship if they're in an internship at all because they're spending all of their time on classes. And is that what an employer wants to see? Absolutely not. So just get advice about this stuff. When you are double majoring, and, and we had a question about this, um, and I won't ask Professor McDowell to answer it because we all know the answer now. Can you combine international relations and political science? Of course you can. That is a low stress situation. A lot of these courses are gonna double count, meaning that you take one course and it checks the box for international relations and it checks the box for political science, for example. So combining similar programs is easy. Combining arts and sciences in Maxwell is a little bit more difficult, but still totally reasonable. And then like Professor McDowell said, once you get really outside the box and maybe you're doing a different college altogether at Syracuse, then it gets a little more difficult, but it's all possible with good advice. And that is more than available to you. It's just a matter of opting in. Um, okay, I have another question for Professor McDowell, which is how competitive political science students are for the Maxwell and DC program. Uh, the two of you, I think, have stirred up a good amount of interest in this, which is great because it's a fantastic program. Uh, so, could you talk at all about any students, what they, how they prepare for the program, how cutthroat it is or is not? I actually don't know the answer to this. I know it's a competitive program. I don't know how intense. Yeah, I can talk for a moment about that. Amy, you, you may you may actually have more um, experience than I do on the Maxwell and DC pro program. Do you want to do you want to take that question and I can add to it if you? If yeah. There, yeah. I, I can take that one. Um, so the Maxwell and Washington program is only open to juniors and seniors. Um, it runs spring and fall. There there is not a summer program uh, for undergraduates. Um, Traditionally, there have been 18 slots available each semester. I believe in the future that may expand. Um, the program has gone through some changes in the last six months uh, that I, I think may result in more seats being available in the future. Um, so the general requirements, if you, if you go on the Maxwell and Washington website, which I don't have at my fingertips, um, but I, I can find it and throw it in the chat in a minute, um, you'll see that it's having um, some basic international affairs courses like the intro that's required for, for the international relations major and also applies to the political science major um, and, and having a reasonable GPA. Um, but some of the other things that they look for Study abroad experience is really helpful prior to going to the Maxwell and Washington program. Additional internship experience is really helpful. So all of the courses take place in a seminar format. And when there's only 18 students, it's very discussion-based and you're expected to bring your own experience to the table. And so having some internship experience or some study abroad experience makes you a much stronger candidate. They also want to see students who are going to be able to get um, great internships while they're in Washington, DC, which is another part of the reason it's restricted to juniors and seniors, because those students are more likely to get um, those really productive and exciting internships and contribute in the classroom side of things. Um, so the competitiveness, I, I think, actually varies from year to year. And all of that is run through the Maxwell and Washington team who are physically located in DC. They do come to campus to do recruiting events. 
um, and information sessions, and they are certainly available by phone and email um, to students who are interested. I will find that website and throw it into the chat for you guys, though, too. Thank you. So at this point, I think we've responded to all of your questions in the chat. We do have eight minutes remaining in the time that we had planned. We will not stare at you for eight minutes while you do not ask questions. So if you have further questions for us, please do let us know. And at this point, because we're kind of in a blended format, let us know who you'd like to answer your question. And again, grab a photo of the screen and get the contact information down if you haven't done that already. And you beat me to the Maxwell program, the DC program. Well done. Well, you no, you 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 handled the question for me and did a great job. So I thought I could at least give the link. I also shared a, an email where, where if, if anyone has specific questions about the program, you can email, email um, maxwellndc at maxwell.syr.edu. Um, and we did just get a new director for that program this last year who I'm, I'm really excited about. I think he's got some really great ideas and the program's only going to get better, so. So while we just have a few, oh, here we go. Would you be able to do political science, IR, and education? See, this is the student we are talking to, the, the overeager applicant. Um, since political science and IR are so similar, would that triple major be too difficult or out of reach? I think I have an answer to this, but Amy, it sounds like you have a lot of experience working with these kinds of students. Do you have a specific response or would you like me to take it? I'll give a broad response and I'll probably ask you to follow up. Um, my, my gut reaction to this is that the challenge is certainly not going to be the IR political science side of it, but it's going to be the student teaching side of education that can become logistically difficult uh, junior and senior year. We do have a handful of IR education majors. Um, to my knowledge, none of them are have an additional major as well. Um, so I think probably possible if you came in with a lot of AP credits and, and things like that, but challenging down the road. I, I would definitely agree. Um, it's something that if you want to do, you should use advice every semester. You should be having a conversation. What should I take? Is this the right order? Am I going to get done in time? And again, to Amy's point, which was excellent and something I'll be saying every time a student asks me a question like this in the future, is it actually benefiting you? Does an employer care that you have both the political science and the international relations if you want to be a teacher? Because either of those would prepare you very well to teach a high school level or an elementary level kind of social studies type course. That's an, also a question for your career advisor. Again, an annoying amount of advice, but you should take advantage of it when you're at Syracuse. And then the last question that we'll take for the night, uh, this is one that was mentioned in the chat earlier. So thank you, Adela, for bringing it up again. I think I missed it. Uh, what is the difference in the political science major with a concentration and international relations versus the international relations major on its own? That's a great question. So uh, the main difference is if you were a political science major that wanted to have your concentration uh, be in international politics, which is the, the title we use for effectively international relations as a concentration, you would be expected to meet the political science major uh, requirements, which are different from the IR major requirements. So uh, again, that would mean those three uh, 100 level courses are six upper division courses, one extra any level course. And then three of your courses would have to be within that inter, uh, international politics uh, cluster or concentration, uh, which would mean that you're, you know, in that case, you wouldn't have the regional concentration or the language requirement and you wouldn't have a, a capstone required as part of that major. IR has those additional requirements that are different, right? And if those are the things that appeal to you and you also would, sort of want the interdisciplinary side of things, which is what IR really offers. You could be taking courses in geography, anthropology, political science, economics towards that major. For the political science major, right, we're talking about 30 credits only within political science. So uh, in, in that regard, it's, it's, it's a bit more narrowly focused on the pol political science as a field. Um, but you could, you could do the political science degree with that international politics con concentration and only have three courses that were international politics, the rest could be American politics courses, right? Where that would be different if you were in IR. So it's, it's just that if you're a political science major, you have to meet our major requirements, which are different from uh, IR major requirements. And so you would end up taking, you know, 
different courses. Wouldn't mean that you couldn't take some of the same courses, but it would be different um, in, in that way. Hopefully that is a good answer. Amy, you can add to that if you think. No, I think that that mostly covers it from our perspective. Um, we see one of the really big differences is that interdisciplinary approach. So if you all want to also be taking courses on international affairs that come from geography, history, economics, and anthropology, um, that's something that you would get through the IR major, but not through the political science major. And I'm saying that not as a value judgment because I'm someone who has an undergraduate degree in political science and a master's degree in international relations. So um, they both have a lot to offer, but they are two different programs. I'll just lastly chime in really quickly about just very generally the whole concept of switching majors and deciding what I want to do and is it three and how do I apply. The major you list on the application is the least interesting thing you're going to tell me when you submit your application because I know you're going to change your mind. So none of the programs that we've discussed tonight are more or less competitive than the other. It is just an expression of what you think you're interested in when you apply. And very likely you'll change your mind before you step foot in Syracuse and very likely you'll change your mind again once you're here. So don't stress about this too much right now. The major that you list on your application does kind of tie onto your record when you come to Syracuse. But again, you have to meet with an advisor to make that officially your decision once you're on campus. So none of you need to be too concerned right now about which major should I apply to. You know what your interests are. That puts you already ahead of a lot of students who have absolutely no idea what they want to do in college. And those students are in a perfectly fine situation once they come to campus. So really don't stress about this too much right now. Uh, Kaylin asked a question kind of similar to this in the chat, which I just responded to. Uh, you will be working with an academic advisor on campus. You'll be finalizing these decisions really over the course of the first two years with us. So it's, it's not a point of stress right now. The most important thing is that you know what your options are. And I think we've spent a lot of time on that during this presentation. So I appreciate that from both Professor McDowell and Amy, kind of being willing to go through those mental gymnastics and talk about programs outside of yours and, and the intersections between them. It's a very Syracuse thing to do. So I appreciate that. And students, uh, just don't stress about it too much. If, if it keeps you up at night, email me and we can talk more thoroughly about these kinds of plans. But they, they're going to change all the time for the first few years that you're with us. Rachel, can I throw one thing into that as well? Um, I would just say one of the things that I love about working at Syracuse is that no matter what you're interested in, as you go through exploring that during your first two years, just about any academic program that you are curious about, you can go in and talk to someone there. And, and whether it's a faculty member or a staff member, someone will sit down and, and talk with you about how it fits into your interest. And that's what you really should be doing with your first two years is taking classes and talking to people to figure out what it is you want to do. It's fine if it changes, it's fine if you don't know right away, um, but take the time to go and chat with people about it. People are very, very open to that. I have students who are not declared in my office all the time. Um, and that's what those conversations are about. Yes, we over advise and we're happy to do it. So take advantage of that advice again. So with that, I think we're right on time. The chat is quieted down. So I think we have checked all the boxes for you. Again, our emails are here on the screen. So let us know if you have questions or you know you hang up and you realize ah, I should have asked something. We're happy to respond to that for you. Thank you again, Amy. Thank you again, Professor McDowell for joining us tonight. Students, send them a big thank you. This is not their job. They are doing this out of the kindness of their hearts to help you after hours. So they deserve your thanks. Again, thank you for being here with us tonight and we will see you all next time.